What's going on, Combat Sports Nation? This is Sean here with Slippery Pete, Peter Barrett. What's what going on, Peter? Here we are again. This time we're not side by side, but we we're face to face still. Uh, how are you, my friend? Good, good. Having you know, just another day in paradise. Uh, I I hear that. I hear that. So uh, you you were you were recently uh, a part of a huge highlight of the last show for Access TV, or excuse me, for CES on Access TV for the fans at a minute eight uh, for CES thirty nine uh, highlights. Uh, you were considered to be the most electrifying performance of the night. Uh, did you hear that? I, I did, I did. I heard it in the in the in the recap, and uh, it was awesome. You know, I just really took advantage of that opportunity to to get my name out there. What what word would you use to describe your pay, uh, performance against Jeremy Davis? I mean, uh, perf impressive for sure, electrifying. I mean, since that was thrown out there, that is a great uh, descriptive word. But how would you describe your 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 uh, performance? Uh, aggressive. You know, slippery. That's that's what I do. That's how I fight. I, I go, I get out there, and you know, I don't like to waste time. I like to get right to business and, and get out get get out of there just as fast as I got in. You have a fight coming up. Uh, you're the main event, Cage Titans Fighting Championship 32, Plymouth Memorial Hall against Vince McGinnis. I think this is the biggest gap that you've had as far as um, uh, range. He, yeah. he on on paper, if you look at his stats or his vitals. Um, you know, 6'2", long reach, lengthy guy, but it doesn't necessarily um, uh, show in his fights because he, he sort of sh fights short. He, he uh, doesn't defend necessarily, take down the way uh, you would think a tall, lean, lanky, uh, a lot of leverage guy would. Uh, what more do you know about Vince? Um, his wrestling sucks. <laughs> he gets taken down at will. He, he fights with his hands low. I mean... I'm going to I'm going to attack his weaknesses, and I don't think his reach or his length or his jab or or any of that is really a strength of his. I don't think he knows how to use his length, so I'm just going to expose him and uh, take advantage of the opportunities how I see him. Has there been anything in training that? Um, sorry, Max is right here. I'm just telling him no, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, I mean I. I I'm very critical. I'm very critical of, of my performances. So I'm always, uh, you know, watching my film and looking at things that I want to improve. You know, for me, all I really want to do is fight the way I train. And until I reach that level, I'm, I'm going to be constantly grinding and working and doing what I see fit to get to the next level. During your training, was there anything that you saw in your opponent that you had to sort of tailor a little bit of what he might bring into the cage? For you, for your game plan, for your training. Uh, no, not really, because you know, being at Sitya Tong and that being my home camp, um, we have next level guys in the gym all the time. So Tony Martin's been getting ready for a southpaw, and I've been getting ready for a taller ortho. So it's kind of worked in both of our favors, where I was the go-to guy to push Tony because I'm a southpaw and can can really mimic the style of his opponent. Um, who he's fighting this Sunday on Fox Sports 1. That's right. There we go. Nice There's plug. the plug. Hashtag and, UFC uh, Phoenix. <laughs> so it just so happened to work out perfectly. You know, like you take fights that, that feel right. You take fights that, you know, you, you trust on the people that are making the decisions. And it just, everything came together. And, and there was like a nice little synchronicity that I've noticed where this fight, yeah, I was already working with Tony to get him ready. And this just happened to fall into my lap. So... I haven't tailored anything for him. Um, I was just already mimicking someone else for Tony. McGinnis is a is a righty, and I we we reviewed a film where he was fighting a southpaw, and he didn't know how to move with a southpaw. And if you know that was a fight from a couple of years ago, so those things very easily could have changed. Cool. But if I'm looking at everything else in his game that he hasn't worked on, I doubt fighting against a southpaw was what he really worked on over the past couple of years. He's going to sit right in front of my, excuse me, he's going to sit right in front of my, my heavy left, and, you know, he has low hands. So if I close the distance really quick and touch his chin, he's going to sleep. <laughs> um, 
you know, and, and really watching that film of him not circling and not fighting for the outside gives me confidence in the fact that, you know, that's one of my priorities when I'm fighting someone in the opposite stance, which is all the time because everybody's ortho. Um, <laughs> so it just, it, everything just, it, for me in the, in what I've watched and what I've seen, I'm going to eat him alive. He already lost the fight, you know, just out of his style alone. I mean, I'm watching his film thinking, oh, great, I'm going to, I'm going to, I can exploit him there. I can exploit him there. I can exploit him there. I can only imagine what the hell he's thinking when he watches my fight. <laughs> he's going, oh, man, I like to go three rounds. This kid fucks people up. <laughs> I got to keep that hand a little bit lower so I don't have my dinner for lunch. Excuse me, my liver for lunch. You know? So... I, it doesn't change the way I go in there. I push the pace. I push the pressure. I'm going to chase him down. I'm going to stalk him down. I'm going to take him down and I'm going to put him out. You know, I, can we stand in the middle and bang and, and, and put on a display in an absolute firefight? Fuck yeah, we can. And we probably will, but I'm probably going to take him down and knock him out. So I was doing a little research on him and I came across an interview or, an, or yeah, an interview or an article that was written about him. And he actually, uh, went out to Team Alpha Male a few years ago and was training out there. That's when he met Dwayne. I think he moved to California on a short stint or something and then moved back to Florida. But while he was there in Sacramento, he was training under Dwayne. That's where he met him. That's how they got affiliated. He actually, that might have been the same time Rob was out at, Rob Font was out yeah. at Team Alpha Male because they actually know each other. Okay. Um, but... I've been to Team Alpha Male. I was out there when Chad Mendez got the call to fight Conor McGregor. So um, it's just, I, it's kind of, I found that peculiar that we were both out at City Yatong, I mean, excuse me, out at Team Alpha Male, got affiliated or learned under Dwayne. I mean, I've been out to Colorado this past summer when I was visiting some friends and I trained at Dwayne's school. Uh, so, I mean, we have, where we've been and who we've trained with is very similar, which is very interesting. Everybody wants a quick knockout. Everybody wants the finish. Yours has been, your five of your seven have happened in the first. Has that just been because of, um, that's just the way the fight happened? Or was there some things and some, some <clears throat> holes in your opponent's game that you were like, I'm going to exploit it. It's going to happen quick. I'm in, out, and in the crowd with my fans. The latter, definitely. I mean, I, I like to describe it as highly calculated violence and, you know, I go in there to get out of there as quick as I walked in. You know, I don't, I'm not here to play Patsy cake or beat around the bush. I like to get right to work. I mean, it's, it's a fight who fighting like kind of sucks. You don't want to be in a fight longer than you have to be. You would either go in there, show the dude what's up, knock him out, finish him and get back to living your life so you can get back to training. I mean, for me, I don't want my fight to delay me from getting back into the room. Mm -hmm. I want to take like a week off to, let everything heal, let, let all the swelling go down from the fight and, and get right back to work. If, if I go in there and it's a three round battle and I've got stitches and contusions and my shins are banged up, my feet are banged up, my eyes are cut, my lips are swollen, then, you know, there's going to be a little more time off and I'm going to have to rest and let everything heal before I get back into working the way I want to work. So it's definitely an in and out mentality. Get in there, establish dominance, break his will. Make him submit via verbally, mentally, medically, whatever you want to call it, whatever excuse they've used to get out of the cage with me. They they feel the pain and they feel my pressure and they don't like it. And one of the, the biggest difference with the fighter today and the fighter of past is not necessarily just training hard, but training smart. Uh, can you... Can you explain to me how you make sure, because you're, you're active. I mean, last year you went 3-0. You're, you're very active. Even as an amateur, you're very active. Uh, you stay injury-free. What do you attribute that to? Smart. Training smart. Not being a knucklehead. Not, you know, leaving the ego at the door. Nobody's going into the room to knock someone else out. That's, you know, the worst thing you can do to a training partner. That's the worst thing you can do to a teammate. We all fight. We all have fights coming up. So... You know, the coaches are very involved. Um, I do my strength and conditioning with a strength and conditioning coach. So my martial arts training and my fight training doesn't awesome. double as my conditioning. Nice. I'm already working on that in the morning and then I'm doing my sports specific stuff. 
in my martial arts at night. So I, I don't rely on going extra hard in the room to get me ready for my fight physically and cardio and conditioning wise. I've got ga- I've got a gas tank that can run for days. I do like a half hour interval sprints twice a week. You know what I mean? Like it, I don't because I can rely on my gas tank. I don't have to train like a knucklehead. Mm. Mm. And it's just very well managed by our team. If you had the newest fighter walk into your gym who who didn't say, you know, I want to try MMA out or it's something I want to cross off my bucket list, but it was somebody who had the same passion as yourself to become a champion. What is what is something as advice with training that you would that you would give them? What what is, what is like the top couple things, or what is the top thing that you'd say? Okay, you want to be a world champion. You're not here just to fight on the undercard, or but you want to go to the next level. I think you're a great example to be able to. You're almost there. So, what is the advice that you give somebody who'd want to get to where you are? And then we'll talk about what's the next step. Um, I think most importantly is if you want to do it, do it 100. percent you know, you can't just walk into a room and say, oh, I want to be the toughest guy in here and think that that's going to happen. You're going to be humbled really quick. You know, you can bring the ego out when when you get into the cage. But inside the room, it's not about it's not a dick measuring contest. We're all there to learn. We're all there to get better. So you got to be, you know, you can't be too humble, but you got to be humble. You can't be you can't give too much respect, but just enough. It, it's you know, it's not easier said than done, but it's easier to see than it is to explain um, because you, you you need to be training with the tougher guys because that's the only way you're going to learn. You need to have the lesser inexperienced guys or the, just the less the, the people with less experience than yourself. So you can, you know, that's where you develop your talent. Right. That's where you develop your game plan. And then to have the people above you that can put you right back down in the position that you were just putting someone else in. Right. So it... it and that comes back to having a good team, you know, and I got lucky um, with City of Tongue because Mike Varner, who owns and operates Max Training Center, trained at City of Tongue when he fought. I would tell anyone out there, you know, do some research. Loyalty is big in this game. You can't just go jump around from gym to gym every time you fight to pick a team that you really like. If this is something you want to do. Invest some time into it. Do some research. See what teams are fighting on all the big regional scenes. See what fighters. Find a fighter that you like. Follow him. See where he trains and then maybe, you know, go do a free week there. But do some research and make sure you want to get into it. But And then don't bite off more than you can chew, you know. If you're if you're an amateur, don't make weight, cut and weight part of your, part of your battle. Fight, fight closer to your walking weight. Um, and find an opponent that will walk, that will fight closer to your walking weight. You know, it's not that hard to explain that to a promoter. Hey, you know, I've got an amateur fighter. He walks at 170. Maybe he wants to fight at 165. Promoter's going to say, oh, well, I want him to fight at 155. Well, no, he doesn't really want to worry about cutting weight. He, he just wants to fight. Those conversations can happen, and I feel like they don't enough, especially for the younger guys. Uh, everybody wants to, to cut weight, cut weight, cut weight. Cutting weight fucking sucks. You know, thankfully I've got my system down. It's like a science. I, I rely on it. I depend on it. So it's easy. But my amateur weight cuts were fucking terrible. And I'm swearing to emphasize how <laughs> shitty they were. Okay. Cutting weight when you're fat, when you haven't done enough for the last four to six weeks sucks. It It's physically harder for you to sweat when you have to sweat through fat. Yeah. If you have less body mass, less body fat, you can sweat real quick. Yep. So if you're, if you know, if you're chubby because you were eating Twinkies after training and having ice cream on the weekends and drinking beer with your homeboys up until a week ago, cutting weight is going to be really difficult. You, you have the mindset of you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of fighters that say, once I get there then I will eat cleaner. Once I get there, then I'll cut out some of the part. Once, t- tell, me, tell me what your mindset has been to, to make that transition to saying, I'm one fight away. Not, it is not a pipe dream for Peter Barrett to potentially be one fight away. What has gotten you 
to that point as far as your mindset? Well, one thing I do is I am more recently um, acting as if I'm already there, getting the lifestyle down, making the commitments to myself. Uh, you know, this is a conversation I was just having with Ariel at team training on Tuesday. And, you know, I can't, I can't say I'm going to, like you said, I can't say I'm going to do it when I get there because right. I'm not committing to that lifestyle. I need to commit to that lifestyle to prove to myself that I am going to get there. You know, it's making sure that my diet's in check. It's making sure that I'm keeping my weight right around, excuse me, right around 170. Um, you know, one of my goals is to get my walking weight to 165. And to, I mean, to be honest, that's what I weigh right now. And I'm two weeks out from fighting at 155. Then I'm 10 pounds overweight. I can do that in two days. I can make weight tomorrow if I had to. And it's 1030 at night. You know, it's it's just being prepared and, and getting everything in place. So when the opportunity comes, it's you don't have to scramble to make it work. You know, it's making sure you're putting in the time. You're being consistent. You're being regular with your coaches. You're being uh you know, always in conversation with your manager, with promoters, making sure that your name's at the top of their list when they're looking for someone. Um, uh, you, making the changes career-wise so you can train more. You know, that's something that I'm dealing with right now. It's it's put a lot of stress on me, but I feel like I am at that position. So if I want that lifestyle, I need to make the changes for that for those things to come back to make their their way into my life. And until I do that, I think I'm really holding myself back. And that could be a mental barrier, but, um, you know, I have convinced myself that I need to be training full time, focusing on fighting full time to get there. And once I make that leap, it's going to make everything a lot easier because it, it won't be there. The fear of doing it won't be there because I'll already be living that lifestyle. I'll already have made the changes. The only thing that's going to change when I get to the that phone call is I'm going to be fighting in front of a lot more people in a really big venue, and I'm going to go home with fifty thousand dollars nice. in my pocket. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, that's those are the changes. Those are the exciting changes. It's not shit. I got to quit my job. I got to get in the gym six to seven days a week, mm. all day, every day. I got to find a part time job. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. No, I'm creating the lifestyle to cater me to that, you know, I've got things lined up so I can, I will have various sources of income, whether that be teaching at the schools, um, business deals that I have going on through my professional life that quite frankly, that's something I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm game planning to get out of as well. I mean, I have a great career ahead of me if I were, if I were to walk away from fighting, but I don't want to turn around in 10 years and say, man, you should have quit your fucking job and just went after it and gave it everything you had. And that's where I'm at right now. I want to, I'm at a point where I can, where I believe that if I put that effort into it, the, the rewards are going to be bountiful. I don't know. The rewards are going to be fucking amazing. It's, I, I'm going to have a world title before I'm done. And, I, and it's because of the preparations that I put into place to get there. Now, uh, talking about lifestyle, I know that uh, it's it was talked about that you were hoping or intending or uh, or anticipating. I guess I could could use that word of going to Thailand. Is that something still that is that just a dream or is that a potential vision of, of still in two thousand seventeen? No, that's I think that's my my goal destination this year to go train in Thailand. Because um, you have a coach there now, correct? Yes, uh, Loco Lobo is in Thailand at Sayatong with Crew Toy right now, and uh, it's been awesome watching the videos that he puts up on Facebook every yes. morning because they're almost a day ahead of us, I believe. Yeah. With the it's weird, so we're we're waking up and they're going to bed, so you get to see everything in the morning. You know, they're in the future. <laughs> yeah. So uh, mind blown. Look at that. <laughs> I was, and it's funny because I was just talking to one of my friends from Colorado, you know, talking to MMA and whatnot, and he's saying, oh, you know, make sure you branch out. You got to go learn elsewhere, you know, get a couple different looks. And he had some ideas, and we were just shooting him around. I said, you know, I think this is the year I'm going to go to Thailand in, in maybe two to three weeks, maybe a month. If I could do a, if I could save to, to do a month in Thailand, I think that would be fantastic and be the, the chance of a lifetime, you know, 
an opportunity you never get back. And, it, and it, if I wait to do it, it's not going to be the same as doing it now when I'm young in shape and can really take advantage of the training and, and, and put it back into my craft. Peter, I, I firmly believe that you're, you're one finish away, you're one fight away, you're one impressive performance away from, from your management team getting a phone call to, to uh, make you a feature fight uh, on a huge card. If you could give us an idea of what your walkout song might be. Ooh, and I do need an explanation on what that shirt says because I see it says haters. But I, I well, what's the rest of that shirt there? Uh, let, let's give you let's give you the whole. There we go. Haters are just your fans in denial. Look at there that. It is. There it is. Is there a story uh, with that um, shirt or what? What's that? Is there a story with that shirt or what? Oh man, funny thing about this shirt is uh, I was in Vegas last year for a trade show and I ended up at Dre's really late at night and. <laughs> Nothing good goes on at Dre's late at night, but the shirt happened to come out with me, and you know we had it was a hit. Everybody, all these women wanted to come up and take pictures of it with me, and it was like it was like shooting fish in a barrel, man. It was awesome. So imagine, you know, this shirt, this smile, Dre's nightclub, three o'clock in the morning. It it was fun. It, I'll I'll give you the PG version of that story. <laughs> <That's great>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll get the slippery version later on from you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Well, what can the what can the fans expect? What what could that walkout song be? Um, I think I'm going old school punk. I'm uh, I'm I'm torn. I've got some things going on, you know, on a deeper level that I want to tap into. Uh, some there's like some tribal hip hop that I've been listening to with a lot of drums and a lot of chanting that really gets me fired up on my way to training. But at the same time, I'm, I, I just want to get back to being myself and, and, and stop being such a politicking individual and say, fuck you, I'm going to fuck you up. And it's a fight and it's on. Um, I don't give a fuck about you or where you come from. It's my night and it's my time. And uh, that's how I came into this game. That's That was my mentality when I started. And you know, I've humbled myself over the years. But at the same time, I'm here for me. You know, I, I'm. I'm, I'm my own biggest fan for a reason, and it's because I trust in what I do, and I'm here to fuck people up. <laughs> and, and so, um, once again, Cage Titans Fighting Championship. How can people get a hold of you for tickets? Uh, you can you can direct message me on Facebook. I downloaded that stupid messenger app because they won't <laughs> let you check your messages over your web browser anymore. It's <laughs> such a fucking scam. Um, you can, Get me on Snapchat. You can get me on Instagram. You can direct message over Instagram. Um, I'm pretty sure I have a Venmo link on my Instagram page. <laughs> okay. You can send me $45, and I will hold the ticket for that's, you at will call. Awesome. Uh, um, my Facebook uh, fighter page is Slippery Pete. Um, my Instagram is Slippery Pete 145. The same with my Snapchat. Um, my personal uh, Facebook is Peter Peter Barrett, so I'm very accessible on all forms of social media, uh, on Twitter, uh, Slippery's World. So, Slippery Pete, you can you can find me anywhere. Great to chat with you, brother. We appreciate your time. Uh, look forward to seeing you post uh, pre fight at the weigh ins, post fight combat sports nation. Peter Slippery Pete, Peter Barrett, thank you so much. Absolutely, thanks, Sean and. Peace out, Combat Sports Nation. Woo! Toodles. <laughs> That's right. Toodles, man. Thank you. Follow us on Instagram. Watch us on YouTube. Check us out on Facebook. Visit us on Twitter. And stay tuned.